Hey, happy to be back. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about community matters here at the five o'clock block. We're talking about electric buses and how they are coming to Hawaii uh, with Sutter Home Bus. Eric Sutter Home, the founder of Sutter Home Bus, and his daughter, Gabby Sutter Home. And they join us from Honolulu to discuss their company and electric buses and what they are doing and how the world is changing. Now, welcome to the show, Eric and Gabby. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is my second time I've, I've been on your show. I was on your show about maybe like 20 years ago, I think, right? So you Close finally to it. It was a long, long time ago. And I, may I say that uh, your hair has grown the same way mine has, but not, yeah. not quite, not quite as and, much. And I see <laughs> you walking in Upper Newton Water once in a while. You know? Yeah, that's so me. That's how we, <laughs> we have long discourses on political rhetoric. <laughs> of course. So see, our, very our, important now. So our company started in 1989. We are the largest and really only full service bus dealer in Hawaii and the Pacific Islands. We sell on 28 islands in the Pacific, including Guam, Saipan, Micronesia, and American Samoa. Uh, we started out selling gas and diesel buses, and that's what we still do. But the transition in Hawaii in the Pacific is to electric. And so we're at the forefront of that. We sold our first electric buses to the city and to Hickam Air Force Base in 1994. Oh. Uh, yeah, so we've sold the most hydrogen vehicles, of commercial vehicles that anybody sold in Hawaii. We've sold the most uh, propane vehicles, commercial buses that anybody sold in Hawaii. Uh, the problem is that propane is made from oil in Hawaii. It's really easy to, to use it in you know the mainland where it's 50 cents a gallon and it's made from natural gas. And it's really easy to be green and be inexpensive. Uh, the other fuel, hydrogen, is a great fuel. Uh, if it was being made in Hawaii from wind or solar or, or uh, geothermal, it would be wonderful. But it's made from oil. So hydrogen is very expensive and it's very, very hard to get. And then CNG is the other big fuel for transit buses on the mainland. Again, what does that by, stand for, CNG? Com, com, compressed natural gas. And so that's how it's normally stored. You can also get LNG, which is liquefied natural gas, which when you liquefy it, you can compress it even further down in the smaller categories. But the governor has made it clear that he does not want CNG in Hawaii as a bridge fuel. Very cheap, 50 cents. Uh, it has less emissions, but it's another fossil fuel. And so we have, we'd have to build in huge infrastructure at our ports, and we'd have to get a waiver to the Jones Act because the United States has no CNG uh, ships mm -hmm. CNG in. They're these huge, big bulb things on ships, you know, and they're good targets. So really, the and he, he's also said he doesn't want LNG. LNG, well, here. LNG and CNG basically is the same thing. It's just a, it's just the state. It's in CNG is a gaseous form, and LNG is in a liquid form. And and there are there are vehicles set up for both of those. Uh, there's long there's long range trucks now that are being LNG because LNG you can compress it further, and then you can get more more you know BTUs or more fuel uh, for for longer distance, but so uh, so you've you've looked at these options, and uh, it sounds like you're you're focused after all this on on electric buses. Yeah, uh, for for a number of after considering a number of options and considerations, and and that I guess is your business decision going yeah. forward. It's going to be electric buses for Sato Home Bus. Yeah. Yes. And so Gabby, uh, my daughter, worked for another bus dealer, friends of ours, the Shetkeys up in Portland for two years. And she came back to us at the end of the last year and she just redid our website. Our website was terrible for, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. It was absolutely <laughs> terrible for 10 years. So she just redid it all and there's, elect there's an electric bus section. Well, let's um, take a look at that. Let's take a tour around the website, okay. and specifically the electric bus part of the website. Gabby, why don't you take us on the tour? Yeah, so um, this is a photo. This is of Lightning E Motors, actually, of one of the electric bus manufacturers that we've partnered with. Uh, they take 
existing vehicles like a Ford Transit there and replace the internal combustion engine, drivetrain transmission um, to make it an electric vehicle. So, you know, you have familiar vehicles like the Ford Transits and E450s that technicians, drivers, um, operators all know already and just put an electric system in it. So it's also electric at a more digestible price point. Those look like transformers. <laughs> yeah, so that's the electric system um, that would hook up to the batteries underneath the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So it's a kit basically that they sell that you can install, um, kind of a plug and play way to do it uh, in the vehicle. So, so let me get this straight. And just a, a moment of digression here. <clears throat> and Eric told me about this before. As it, it's better to buy a conventional bus and then and then uh, convert it um, to an electric bus than to buy it as an electric bus uh, well, already manufactured uh, as such. Am I right? In the in the medium to light duty vehicles, that's true. In heavy duty vehicles, which which Hawaii does have a few, the city has three now, and there's some other demo buses here. Those are built from the ground up, the very heavy duty buses, and those are a million dollars a piece landed here in Hawaii. Is that one section or a two section bus? That's a one section bus, but it, you could do a two section. You could do an articulated bus too. That would be two million. But what well, if it was a two section bus, yeah, it would be like at least a million and a half. Mm -hmm. But the the um the uh the in the mid duty buses and vehicles, transit, E four fifties, five fifties, like what handy van operates, um, that market is it's less expensive to do a repower. Because that's a really common chassis that millions, hundreds of thousands of those chassis are built in North America. And it's less expensive. Eventually, you're going to see ground from built to ground up vehicles. But right now, the least expensive way to do that is to repower. So does that mean I, I buy a used conventional bus and then put a new uh, uh, you know, conversion system in it? Or do I buy a new conventional bus and put a conversion system in it? So it's pretty much just offering the end user or the operator different ways to go about it. You know, if they own the vehicle already, then they're not having to pay for a new body, a new chassis, all new shipping costs and expenses. So that's one way to go about it. Or if they, you know, they want the brand new vehicle, they want the brand new warranty and, and the serviceability there. So you can get the new vehicle. So what Lightning E Motors would do, for example, which um, only a couple other companies do this, where they'll take even that brand new internal combustion engine vehicle and switch out the drive system. And so this is actually, this photo is a location, is the location in Loveland, Colorado of Lightning E Motors. So for their kit, they'll either, you know, bring the vehicle brand new to that location and do the kit install or ship the kit here where we can be able to do the, uh, the conversion at our location. Well, how complex is that? What, what kind of skill do you need uh, to do the conversion yourself here in your location? Yeah, so what we're, um, what we're doing is we're gonna be trained by the Lightning E-Motors top technicians and mechanics so that we'll be able to be the service, the warranty, the install location. And, um, you know, we're not we're not seeing it as an incredibly difficult project. Um, we would just be trained and we would be able to do it. Uh, we're buying special equipment to be able to do the project. Um, and, you know, just having the support of the manufacturer will be huge for us. Well, that, that takes us to this whole thing about, um, you know, conventional vehicles versus electric vehicles and um, how dealers react to that transition. Um, so, you know, the, the whole notion of automobile dealerships is built around having points, locations, um, and having, you know, skilled mechanics who are skilled in, you know, in fossil fuel cars, I guess. Uh, and then you, and then you say to them, hey, we want to go to electric cars. And so the fossil fuel mechanics don't necessarily know about that. And you have to change your tools. You have to change your whole way of thinking to move to electric. 
Um, aren't you going to be doing the same kind of transition to move from fossil fuel buses to electric buses? Yes, we're, we're, it's, a, it's retraining. Um, actually, you're, you're, you're taking away thousands of parts to go away when you go to an electric vehicle. Electric vehicle is much simpler. So you don't have fluids, filters, belts. Uh, there's really no tune up. So you're taking an ele you're taking an uh, electric you know a, a technician you know I, I say I I last engine I rebuilt rebuilt was a 1964 Volkswagen in 1968 and I asked people <laughs> you know it was the Führer's car and you know it was a very simple car and I rebuilt it on my shop table but what's happening is cars now are very very complicated and electric cars are actually simpler. So you're going to take a technician, and he, you're, it's already cars were getting to the point where you have techs, you don't have mechanics anymore, and you're diagnosing things. So what you're going to be doing is re, you're going to be diagnosing, and you're going to find out if you got a fault code or something like that, and and you're going to you know you're going to re reboot it like you do a computer, and if then if you find out a certain fault code, then you're going to replace components. And and reset up the thing. So so electric so technicians are going to be higher trained, and they're going to get better pay. Because right, so they're going to get better pay because it's it's getting more complicated. But you're going to have less technicians because electric vehicles don't have as much adjustment as as you have with a with the ICE internal combustion engine. So it's easier for both the dealer and the customer, the user, um, with an electric vehicle, because if something goes wrong, you switch out the parts, yeah. and it, you don't have to uh, go through the same kind of mechanical process to fix things. Uh, but is it cheaper or more expensive? So actually, you get about 85% less maintenance required because you don't have the oil changes, the filter changes, and especially because of regenerative braking. So you're not doing nearly as many brake jobs and repairs because when you're braking in an, in an electric vehicle, you're just getting that power right back. So the way that the vehicle reabsorbs that pretty much does away with brake pads and rotor changes. And your tires even last longer, you know? And so uh, we, we're, I'm on my third electric car now and uh, we have electric cars in our fleet. My service manager and techs drive them. And so we've, we've gotten used to working on high voltage. Uh, what, you know, how it's going to happen, hopefully, uh, or how it's going to happen, hopefully there'll be more incentive. Now, I'm one of the last bald-headed, moderate Republicans left in Hawaii. I think there's five of us left, you know? And I'm a. I'm I thought a, we weren't going to discuss politics on the show. Well, but I'm a in Hawaii, this state. I'm a social liberal and a fiscal conservative, and there's no party for that. So, <laughs> but what's going to happen in in California, where it's that where the the electric vehicles are at the forefront, there's huge incentive, and you can you can get like a hundred thousand dollars for an electric bus, which pays for the differential. And so we've lobbied the legislature for that. The legislature seems to want to talk about mandates. You know, I'm not big on mandates. I'm I'm big more big on on incentives to get things going. Right now, we have thousands of electric cars in Hawaii and a few electric 40 foot buses, but nothing in between. So we're going to repower a transit. What Gabby was saying, and in, in June we're going to have the first mid size vehicle electric in Hawaii, and we're coming down to pick you up. Okay, I'm good for that. But let's let's uh, back to Gabby now. Lightning is the one that was in the newspaper a few days ago, yeah. um, and and the one you know with this beautiful looking vehicle, which you showed us a picture of. But Lightning is not the only one. Yeah, that's the Lightning bus, huh? Yep. Um, uh, but there are others you're looking at, or you're going to bring in. Can you talk about that, Gabby? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Lightning is at the forefront of fleet electrification for existing vehicles like the Ford Transit, the E450, um, things like that. And, and you know, they're, they're going public through a SPAC right now. And um, so they're, they're one of the ones that we're very interested in, especially. We have a really good relationship with them. Um, but we also represent another called Lion Electric, um, and they're based in Canada. They do school buses. 
And they basically went from making the dirtiest vehicles ever, diesel buses, to all electric. So they don't offer anything but electric vehicles now. Uh, and so especially for school buses, it's a really great opportunity to do electric because you're driving typically in the morning and in the afternoon. And so you have all day, which is the cheapest time to charge, to plug the bus in. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you drive it, uh, you can have some of the models go up to 170 mile range. And so in Hawaii, we don't even really need that, maybe on the big island, but, uh, you know, you drive it in the morning, you plug it in during the day to get the cheapest charging time. And that's, you, and that's when solar is available, too. Yeah. That's why it is the cheapest charging time. Well, I, I want to take a break um, and talk about that for a minute, too. Uh, just as, uh, you know, range anxiety uh, drives uh, the market in many ways, a lot of people um, won't buy an electric car because they worry about it even theoretically, uh, even if it's not as bad as it used to be. You know, batteries are bigger and, <clears throat> and there are more charging stations. But it, it remains that there's only 13,000 uh, electric vehicles in the state when there are a million cars in the state. So a query, what about the buses now? Um, you know, we, we need them to be charged, even if it's during, you know, low, low cost hours, so to speak. Uh, but we still need them to be charged. Where are they going to be charged? Uh, are, they, are, are you offering, you know, a charging station for your customers? Or does the customer have to get his own charging station? What are the options? With a bigger vehicle and a bigger battery, you need a bigger charging station, don't you? Um, well, uh, can you talk about that? The big change in electric vehicles, the reason why electric vehicles are now at the forefront is battery technology has changed. The original vehicles that Ford made were battery, you know, lead acid battery electric vehicles a long time ago, but they couldn't go very far. So, you know, I've transitioned from cars that, that had a hundred mile range. Now, now cars have 250 to 300 mile range. That changes everything. The same thing is happening with buses, but buses are unique because buses are depot charged. So, you know, you basically charge it, you can have a really centralized depot, and then you can go out and, and you know, the first buses that they take, we did a proposal, Gabby did a proposal to handy van, to repower 10 handy vans. That 120 mile range or so is not gonna do every route, but it would probably do 60 or 70% of the route. Let's start with those. Let's start with the, you know, the low hanging mangoes, you know? And, you know, we'll, we'll get to the 300 mile around, around the island someday. But, the, you know, what we can do is we can provide a complete, through Lightning and through other manufacturers, a complete solution with charging infrastructure, wiring, solar panels, the whole deal. So there's, there's lots of, there's PUC credit available for chargers. There's federal tax credits for solar. So there's lots of, uh, and if you go back to this whole thing, the original guy in Hawaii, the original guy that started this whole thing is Kelly Judd from Inner Island Solar. Sure. He built the very first electric car that I know of in Hawaii, converted an electric, converted a car electric with lead acid battery, and then built the biggest, he still owns the biggest solar water heater company in, in the United States and California, and then he transitioned Inner Island Solar, the, the electric panel, uh, Distributor through an ESOP, you know, and so he's. But uh, so well, what, what I what I hear you saying though is that you can outfit me with a, a kind of uh, solar facility that will um, charge a charging station that will uh, oh. provide electrical power for a charging station, and I can use that to charge my bus or my car for that matter, yes. and that would be economic. Yes. It's economic. It's economic right now. The, the other thing that's happened is, uh, you know, due to the pandemic, due to lots of other things, the relative cost between a gasoline vehicle and an electric vehicle is almost parity. And the reason why is everybody's stealing catalytic converters. And they're stealing them off our, our buses off our lot today. And, and what's happening is because catalytic converters are in such short supply, that's actually slowing down production of gas vehicles in the United States because they don't have enough catalytic converters and they don't have enough rare chemicals, which is what you have to, minerals, which you have to 
make catalytic converters and catalytic converters have gone up you know substantially in cost and so whereas batteries continue to fall so we did a we did i did a proposal to the doe in october and my batteries came down from october till this month twenty thousand dollars in in just cost so you're you're going to see parity within a few years in cars and very few very soon within buses and that's that's going to be so, uh the change well that's but what you know what i what i get is that if i'm um doing commercial buses commercial buses and you guys are selling commercial buses um then um i i probably need to have my own charging facility for those buses wherever i park them during the day or the night you know during the the off hours, whatever. Um, and so it, it, it behooves me um, to get a charging station for, for those buses. And that's really a different thing than the individual who has an electric car um, because you know he's not gonna be able to afford a big charging station. He's gotta go outside. And but I think the whole charging station, you know, and we interviewed a, a company that's putting charging stations in office buildings and condos, you know, in the parking lot there. And this is a shared arrangement. The whole thing is very high tech. And, uh, and th but that's all they do. It's, it's in big buildings. So we have a, a wave of charging stations coming on the line. And it's not necessarily from government. In fact, it isn't from government. And well, it's not necessarily from the utility either. The, it's the from first, facilities the, like you're talking about. The first guys that are going to get electric buses our government you know and they are actually all the mayors signed a, a, a thing out on the hokulea a couple of years ago that they they want the 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 electric uh, fleets the fleet the commercial i mean sorry the municipal fleets on the four islands the four counties to be electric by 2035 and they jay stanbro who was the head of sustainability under caldwell called me up because he had a leaf and we had a leaf too, and he couldn't get the four mares to, to Bokai Bay and back. So he called us up and we have vehicles that can go 250 miles in rain. So we took all the mares to Bokai Bay and got them back, which is important. And so the thing is that what's happening is that those are going to be the first guys that do it, the government guys, they're going to be at the forefront. But the big thing is these guys all have a problem is infrastructure because they wanted their first thing was to get big 40 foot bus well a big 40 foot bus has has 525 or 550 kilowatts of energy huge amount of energy takes a long time to charge that so you have to have a level 3 480 charger you know not everybody has 480 we don't have 480 on dillingham boulevard you know so we had to get a get a booster to boost it up to put a fast charger in a bit a transformer but so the, the low hanging mangoes is is micro transit. That's the future. That's what that transit is. Because with a transit or E450, which is a handy van, what we can do is we can use just a level two charger, this, which is what what you guys use for your house and stuff like that. A level two charger. They're a little bit more advanced, but they only cost about two thousand dollars, and you can wire them up to your two twenty line for maybe a thousand dollars. So the infrastructure, and so, so maybe you have five buses, maybe you need three or four chargers. The relative infrastructure cost is not that much. We could provide it in a lease, we could provide it to roll it into the cost of the equipment. Um, the other thing is we're dealing with a company called Sustainability Partners. And they are, uh, they've got a uh, exclusive 10-year contract with the state of Hawaii, they won an RFP, for the state of Hawaii and all the counties to uh, provide infrastructure funding, not a lease, it's not financing, it's actually a utility type of usage. They charge you per mile when you use the vehicle. And they funded their first transaction with 41 Teslas or the DOT. The local uh, partner in it is a guy named Benson Medina who as it turns out, went seventh grade with me at Kyler Intermediate. So <laughs> yes. that's just the way Hawaii is. All, so. all things begin at Kyler Intermediate. All I things that. begin. I, he, I think he was a big folk, actually, you know. So, but that's another whole story. So, 
so, but, you know, so they're funding these things. And what happens is infrastructure, in the United States, we're capital poor, really. I mean, if you look at our infrastructure and Hawaii is the poster boy for capital poor. And then you add the pandemic and we're doubly, you know, capital poor. And so these guys could come in and literally they fund in the high millions and the low billions. So they could come in and build your infrastructure. They can build your lot. They have solar panels, charging stations, fund the vehicle. And it doesn't cost you anything to put the equipment in, but you have to it pay per mile. Until you start using the vehicle. You, you know, know, you know what? One thing you said though, I think is very interesting, and, and that is that if I have five buses in my my fleet, so to speak, um, then it's much better for me to have five charging stations. Yeah. And that micro charging station you talked about, that yeah. sounds very appealing because I can charge them all at the same time. I don't have to rotate them around, oh. uh, you know, uh, you know, to, 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 to change positions or change the connection. One, two, three, four, five. I can do them all at the same time. And I think for that reason, any, any organization with a fleet is going to want to have, you know, the, these uh, these charging stations that that will allow more than one bus to be charged at a time. This is really important. Travel Plaza is, which is owned by Japan Travel Bureau, has Proterra buses. They have a depot charger down in Evole. It's super efficient. And Gabby, and part of Gabby's analysis that she did with Handy Van is then you, your driver doesn't go go to the gas station and sit there for you know twenty minutes filling up gas. You, you, you just plug in at night and they're all ready to go. This is the future, you know, and there's no reason why a solder home bus can't take advantage of, of this kind of um, infrastructure and make it available to individual cars. You know, I'm just tipping yes. you off on this. Might be an interesting thought to have um, because in the end, it's the same connect, connecting hardware, it's right? Connecting. It's the same connecting hardware yes. for a car or a bus. We charge our one of our cars on our level three fast charger in an hour. You know, that's how fast it charges. You know, or you could charge it overnight for you know eight, seven or eight hours or whatever. There's lots of variations. We I have you know two branded uh, two Ford chargers, just basic 220 chargers. And I charge my truck car that, that goes about 250 miles. I charge it on the weekend during the, you know, because I'm I'm cheap and I got, you know, I got uh, solar panels and I'm net metering. So I charge it while I'm mowing my lawn with my manual lawnmower. You know, that's, you know, <laughs> <and> then, <laughs> so you can't get any more greener than that. And during the day, I get it totally charged and it lasts all week. So, so let me let me talk for a moment about um, about maintenance of these buses. Um, you mentioned before the show that you have maintenance facilities on all islands. Yeah. Um, so the buses you've been selling for 30 plus years, you have facilities to take care of them. But do you plan to have maintenance facilities of, for the uh, electric buses on all islands? Because, yes. I mean, if we are involved in a great movement toward electric buses, we need to have these facilities, charging and also yes. maintenance facilities on every island. Is that is that the future, Gabby? Yeah, So so one of the things, you know, with the vehicles that we sell, they're very specific and the components on them are very unique. And so, you know, at our shop here on Dillingham. But what you're telling me is that the lightning bus is going to be different than the other kinds of buses. And if you're maintaining all the buses, you have to be able to do each different kind of bus, right? Yes, exactly. And the components on the bus as well. You know, there's the wheelchair lift, different kinds of suspension, different cameras. Yeah. And so for, you know, 30 plus years now, our shop, as well as all of our contracted service shops on the other islands, on our neighbor islands, you know, they've been working with these unique components and unique vehicles. So they've been able to learn and adapt all this new technology. So, you know, one more new technology, two more pieces of new technology. They'll be able to learn it. They'll be able to figure it out. And especially with something so new, like electric then it's going to be even more uniquely poised because, you know, then maybe that shop is the only shop in that town that can do it. You know, if you're on the Kona side of the big island, then that's where you have to go. You have one, one shop and they know exactly how to service all of these vehicles. 
That's but great. Our, our, our <laughs> customers, our customers though, Jay, are going to end up with probably only one or two types of electric buses. Sure, you wouldn't want to have too many. Is no, that no, complicates no, your so fleet? A small one and a big one. And yeah. So if it's a school bus guy, they'll have a small school bus and a big school bus. If it's a commercial guy, they might have a, a van and maybe a mid-sized bus. So we might, we're, we're the guys that would know all the technology, but they don't have to know everything. But the trend is Gabby just uh, is selling a, a shuttle bus to the new uh, Kona brewery in Kona, such so a shuttle them around. But they want to go electric. I mean, the next bus, they want to go electric. We're selling buses to, we've sold buses and we're selling more buses to Hawaii Forest and Trail that take people up into up to Mauna Kea and they take people up into the, the ranches to do, you know, bird watching. How, how cool is it to go up there in a four wheel drive, all electric transit that you can creep up on the birds and they don't even hear you coming. <laughs> That's another <laughs> point of sale there. You know, one, one thing that strikes me though, is that um, these buses um, are gonna use the same kind of uh, frame, chassis, battery equipment, drive, what have you, as a truck would use. Um, and if you're selling buses today, um, I don't know who else is selling, you know, industrial quality electric trucks, if any, anybody on the, on this, you know, the islands. And I wonder if that's, if that's something for you in the future. Well, I have a good friend of mine who sells trucks, a uh, guy named Nathan Reyes, who's the Allison Transmission distributor in Hawaii and the Pacific. And one of the things that's happening is, you know, you have to look at obsolescence. So electric drive doesn't have transmission. So Nathan's whole business model goes away because transmissions are going to go away. Electric drive is direct drive. So he formed a company a while back called Hawaii Specialty Vehicles, and he sells the fire he sells the fire trucks and the and the garbage trucks uh, to the cities and the counties, and those are going to go electric instead of having a garbage truck coming to your neighborhood and waking you up. I mean, when they come through Upper Nuuanu, I, I can hear them at your house, you know, and so they're that stuff's going to go away. Well, you know, but they talk about how these batteries uh, only last so many years. And then they have to be replaced, and you know it's a it's a significant part of the cost of the vehicle in the first place. The you know replacing the battery, and I wonder if there's there are new models to, coming to town. I mean, financing models and purchase batteries, models, batteries where where and maintenance models where somebody says to start a home bus, look, I thank you for the bus, but I want a maintenance agreement that will cover me in case I have to replace any of this. I know I at some point I will. Uh, can you, are you doing that? Well, for, for example, um, with Lightning E-Motors, you know, the batteries alone come with a certain warranty. And then they also have in their system, it's a very plug and play technology. So even as batteries are advancing and getting better then that same drive system, you can just take the batteries out bring new batteries in, plug them in, and you don't have to change the whole system. But I, can I get on a plan? and pay a maintenance cost and have that covered or do I have to dig deep to recover it to, to, to re, 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 replace my battery? You can lease the batteries, but what's happening is technology is changing so fast that a lot of the standard battery uh, warranty some places around seven to eight years. But what's happening is there's a prediction now in two years that batteries are going to be 25% uh, less expensive, less dense, and 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 more and 25% more range. And in five years, 50%. So it might be that you say, oh gee, I paid uh for this thing, but maybe in five years, if you can get double the range or 50% more range and they cost 50% less, you might just say, I'm gonna get rid of my batteries, and there's a whole place to recycle them. You can take them and then put them into photovoltaic systems for uh for battery recapture. You know, for battery storage. Sure, and there, so, there are secondary purposes that you can secondary apply. Purpose. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. Those, and those batteries then, because you don't, the whole thing with batteries is how many times you charge them and uncharge them, how many, yeah. how many cycles you have. Yeah. And so if you just put them into battery storage, they might last 15 or 20 <laughs> years. You know, so, so, so we're almost out of time, Eric. I, I don't want to ask Gabby one last question here, and you can, you can add to it. You know, are we are we in a a revolution toward electric trucks and and buses and for that matter cars? 
Do you see, Gabby, uh, you know, in, in your working life, a time when all the vehicles in the state of Hawaii are, are all electric? Do you see that? Absolutely. I mean, all pretty much all of the large car manufacturers have at some point agreed to flip their entire inventory to electric. That's the trend among everyone, you know, with Toyota Sienna, it's all hybrid right now. You can't even get a gas Toyota Sienna. Um, so it's, it, they're going that direction. And, and when you really think about the indirect cost, which I think should be even more of a direct cost of our health, you know, it's, it's almost priceless because we're going to have less exhaust in the air. We're get, it's going to be healthier for people to breathe. Our air pollution will significantly go down. So when you factor in those indirect costs of our health and the planet's health, I really see no other alternative, Um, you know, especially with buses, because you can fit so many more people on the bus footprint. And and it's economies of scale. It's more efficient per passenger travel that way. I yeah. My my family has been very green. My mother forced me to eat brown bread and brown rice back in the early 60s in Kailua but my daughter is an activist so you know I'm green but my daughter's an activist so it's a whole other level I would expect nothing nothing other than that I would expect yeah, that yeah so so but but we also you know we're small business people and we make a profit I don't I don't apologize for that but I look at this also as a matter of economic survival I believe in five to ten years, if we're not if we're not if we're not selling electric vehicles today, we won't be in existence in five to ten years. And this business, our company's been in business now for over almost thirty five years. And Gus, my son, and Gabby, my daughter, our daughter, are taking over for Denise and I in the next number of years. And that's their future. Eric, you must be a happy man. I know you're a happy man. You're happier today than you were before, even 20 years ago when I when I met you. <laughs> Eric Soderholm, uh, Gabby Soderholm, the proprietors, if you will, of Soderholm Bus, and has a great future in Hawaii. Thank you so much, Eric and Gabby. Okay, really Dave, appreciate it. Thank you very it. much, and I'll see you on the trails of uh, uh, Upper New Water. <laughs> Absolutely. Aloha. Oh, <laughs>